Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Grand Rounds for the Department of Medicine. Uh, I'm John Hickman, one of the chief residents. It's my pleasure, as always, to welcome you back. Uh, very excited today for our talk. We have our very own ID department led by Dr. Bill Powderly here, who's going to help moderate for us for an important update on COVID for everyone. So I don't want to waste any time. We've got three fantastic speakers, and we want to have some time for questions later. Send any questions you have through the chat and our Q&A function. Dr. Powderly will moderate that today with our speakers. Dr. Powderly, take it away. Thanks, John, um, and good morning, everybody. It's uh, now two years into the uh, COVID epidemic. And while we gave uh, a lot of attention at the beginning of the epidemic to various aspects of our understanding of, of COVID, it's been a while since we've, we've given an update, um, particularly related to, to issues regarding pathogenesis uh, and uh, interventions. And so um, this is not going to be a COVID epidemiology update. I think many people are, know that we're in yeah, the fourth recognized surge with the, the new variant, but, but fortunately it does appear to be coming down in terms of the numbers. Instead, we're going to focus on some of the scientific advances that have occurred. And this first speaker uh, is uh, Mike Diamond. Mike is the uh, Herbert Gasser Professor of Medicine, Professor of Molecular Microbiology, Pathology and Immunology here at Washington University. Mike um, uh, has been heavily involved in our understanding of the basic uh, biology of this virus, particularly its immunopathogenesis. And uh, I will ask him to start us off. Mike. Great. Okay. I'm going to hope that you guys can see this as I sort of move up here. Let me just load it up. Um, is that good? Looks good. Great. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the context of where we are in the, in the pandemic as it relates to the biology of the SARS-CoV-2 variants. And I will spend a bit of time on Omicron in particular, but I want to put this in the background of where we have been and where we uh, may be going as well. So uh, some disclosures, I have advisory boards for Moderna, Veer, uh, Immunome, if you wanna look at them in detail, they're uh, in the CME package. Um, most antibodies that we're trying to generate in the context of vaccination or even natural infection and based immunity are targeting the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. The spike protein is the outside protein on the surface of SARS-CoV-2. You've probably heard a lot about it. This is the one that's being targeted for vaccines. And in the spike protein that has two different components, there's an S1 fragment and an S2 fragment with a cleavage site. And within the S1 fragment are the regions that are recognized by neutralizing antibodies. There are some that recognize this N-terminal domain, but the vast majority of them recognize this receptor binding domain. And within this receptor binding domain, there's a receptor binding motif. And this is the area that binds the receptor so that antibodies that bind the spike protein in this region would disrupt uh, the receptor binding. In this case, human ACE2 is the receptor. This is just an image from structural biology, which really has led us at, and provided significant insights into understanding how neutralizing antibodies are working. And a number of these are actually ones that correspond to the ones that are in clinical use right now. And what they all sort of do is they bind the RBD in this top position, and they may come in at different angles, if you will, one way or the other, but they are able to sterically block engagement of the receptor, uh, ACE2, and then which prevents the virus from then having a subsequent cleavage event or internalizing by an independent mechanism. So what's the problem? We have all these tools that we've generated, uh, therapeutic antibodies, uh, vaccines over the past year, which has been a year, year and a half now, which has really been remarkable progress considering for any other viral infection, it took four years to generate a vaccine. I can only imagine where we would be in the pandemic if we didn't have vaccines or any therapeutics. The problem has been SARS-CoV-2 has experienced antigenic drift and some would argue even antigenic shift now as we move to the Omicron variant. And why this has happened? In part because there's millions of infections worldwide, uh, hundreds of millions of infections, and it's an RNA virus that can mutate pretty rapidly. And even though this virus has its own unique proofreading enzyme, which is unusual for RNA viruses compared to DNA viruses, because the force of infection is so high uh, across the population and even within individuals, uh, you have the possibility of selecting for escape mutations or for selecting for mutations that enhance transmissibility. Those are really the two things that the virus is selecting for. Uh, 
The other problem is that it, a number of people are uh, uh, immunocompromised, of course. They may have partial immunity. And so it can happen just like in HIV, where you have a, a virus that's being selected for continuously against the immune response. In people that are unable to clear the virus rapidly, you can then get um, uh, uh, escape mutations. And this was thought to be uh, the origin of the alpha variant in Kent, uh, UK, and also possibly uh, the Omicron variant in, uh, in parts of Africa. Another reason is that the vaccine-induced immunity that we generate, which is good in the lower respiratory tract, uh, i.e. the lungs, really doesn't accumulate to high levels in the upper respiratory tract, or the, what we call mucosal immunity. And uh, that's because antibodies don't penetrate into the respiratory mucosa well, probably at about one to two to 5% at the serum levels. So this means you have lower levels of antibody, which then are not able to completely neutralize the virus, which set up an escape selection. There's also a problem of waning a serum immunity. As we know, uh, two doses are good, but after six months or so, we see waning immunity, and then we see the possibility for selection of um, uh, escape. There's another problem that this virus has the capacity to jump into enzootic reservoirs. We know it probably came from bats. It can go into deer, minks, and other animals. And when it does this, it can diversify at the receptor level uh, as well as in other places and then jump back into humans. And this can allow for shift. And finally, SARS-CoV-2 has a relatively high rate of recombination. It's not clear this how much this has contributed. There was the uh, um, the Delta Cron uh, idea that happened, which now I think people have, are, have debunked, but this is still a possibility for de generating de genetic diversity. So in my laboratory, we've been interested in understanding the significance of this genetic diversity over time as it relates to neutralizing antibodies and vaccines. And so I'm gonna show you some of the work that was published recently by Rita Chen, who was an MSTP student in my lab, who now is uh, on her clinical clerkships. And what she did was to acquire a mass and put together a large panel of uh, bona fide infectious SARS-CoV-2 viruses corresponding to ones that were variants of concern or variants of interest. They had a number of different mutations, either in the NTD or the RBD, or even in the receptor binding motif. And to take these and then test them for their ability to uh, escape uh, uh, antibody neutralization. And what we were very much interested in were the antibodies that are in clinical development, those or that are either already under EUA and approval or those that are pretty far along. And so we tested in one of our initial studies, a series of these corresponding to the AstraZeneca antibodies. These are ones that are the academic versions of these that we acquired from our collaborator uh, at Vanderbilt Jim Crow's laboratory. And there's individual ones and a combination. These correspond to the VIR antibodies or VIR GSK antibodies. These are the Regeneron antibodies. And Lilly antibody is here, and then there were some other antibodies that were early on thought to progress, but ultimately didn't. And what you can see here is with a wide panel of viruses that Rita had in the laboratory, this is all pre-Omicron, I should say, um, the, uh, the AstraZeneca ones, you don't see any shift in neutralization, suggesting they should have uh, relatively equivalent potency. The VIR ones also did quite well. There was a couple of uh, mutations in a couple of the variants, which were liabilities for one of the two Regeneron antibodies. But when you used a combination, they worked quite well. But the Lilly antibodies really had uh, problems with uh, several of the variants, especially those that had key mutations at this position, E484K in the spike protein in the receptor binding motif, as well as another one, 477N. And so this began to suggest that certain viral variants would be um, problematic for certain uh, of the uh, clinically uh, used antibodies or ones in development. And then of course, Omicron came along, uh, Rita had already moved on, and then Laura Van Blargen was a postdoc in my laboratory and a research scientist afterwards, and she picked up the project and then looked to see what the impact of Omicron was. Now, this is Omicron's mutation. So I showed you before in the sled with Rita, all of the other variants together. Now we have the single variant, which is Omicron. And I think you can appreciate there's about 30 mutations here. I'm not listing all of them, including deletions and insertions in the N-terminal domain, and then all of these mutations in the receptor binding motif, and then a number of these mutations in the receptor, bi uh, in the receptor binding domain and the receptor binding motif. And this creates a lot of problems because most of the antibodies are actually binding here. And in this slide that was put together by uh, John Arico, and uh, it's a joint student between David Freeman and myself, uh, uh, um, put together, he basically put red dots where the mutations are for the individual footprint of each of these clinically relevant antibodies. And what you can see here, these are the antibodies, they're binding ribbon diagrams coming in on the spike. 
And you can see that the red dots are right where all of the binding sites are. And so this, as you might imagine, could in theory be a problem for these antibodies uh, maintaining their neutralization potency. And indeed, if you align this and actually look at the footprint, so here, these are the antibodies, their names. These in blue is the structural footprints of where these antibodies are binding on the spike, and they have large numbers of contact residues. And then in red are the mutations in the receptor binding domain uh, of uh, the Omicron variant. And you can see many of them overlap with uh, the footprints of these antibodies such that they might be impacted. And indeed, when Laura went to look at this, the situation was substantially worse than with other variants. Um, every one of the, uh, pr virtually every one except one of the authentic antibodies, uh, 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 the antibodies that are used in clinical um, uh, practice now that we tested showed significant either loss, complete loss or shifts in their neutralizing potency. So this would be the um, AstraZeneca antibodies. We see about a 20 fold shift to the right, which means it has decreased potency, no activity of the Regeneron antibodies, um, uh, no activity of the Lilly antibodies, either alone or in combination. This is neutralization. This is loss of neutralization. However, one of the antibodies, S309, which is the parent antibody of citrovimab, um, which is the VRGSK one, only showed a small shift, but other ones uh, showed a complete loss of activity. And so this suggested that most of the commercially used antibodies were going to lose activity completely, lose it substantially, with only a couple of them showing uh, retention of activity against Omicron. And you can sort of appreciate this if we just show you the numbers here. Um, these are single, these are uh, the nanogram per mil uh, IC50 values, and you can see many of these antibodies, Regeneron, Lilly, and others, they uh, completely lose their neutralizing activity greater than 10,000 nanograms per mil or 10 microgram per mil activity, which would not be expected to show any efficacy in vivo. So um, in the last few minutes, I'll just go through how do the um, uh, variants affect RNA vaccines. Um, and so this has certainly been a question uh, that we've been looking at both in animal models, but also obviously in the context of studying humans who've been either vaccinated uh, once, twice, uh, three times with uh, either mRNA-based vaccines or combinations of uh, adenoviral and mRNA-based vaccines. And so uh, in this study, uh, Bao Ling Ying led this with a number of other people from my laboratory, uh, including Larissa Thackery, who uh, also spearheaded this project with me. And then we collaborated with Moderna to use some of their vaccines to study this uh, in the preclinical animal models. And basically what we did was we vaccinated animals. We used a transgenic mouse, so it's highly susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. This mouse expresses human ACE2 because the mouse ACE2 doesn't work quite as well for so many of the SARS-CoV-2 strains. And you prime uh, these animals, you boost them, and then you wait a period of time, and then you can either bleed them and analyze them immunologically for their T cell responses, their B cell responses, and ultimately you challenge these mice. And we challenge them with di many different strains including alpha, beta, delta, mu, and in this case, we also looked at Omicron as well. And we used a couple of different doses of the vaccine, a high-dose vaccine or a low-dose vaccine. And what we've noticed over time is the low-dose vaccine, and I'll show you some of the data on this, sort of gives an immune response that appears more like the human immune response, <clears throat> where the high-dose uh, vaccine works quite well, but we see uh, the levels are super physiologic relative to what we see in humans. And our question was, how do mRNA vaccines protect against variant SARS-CoV-2 strains when we can control the environment completely? We know when we vaccinated them, they haven't had prior infection, but just if you look at these individuals, what is the uh, relationship between Omicron and other variants? And the first thing I'm gonna show you are some neutralization curves, which uh, neutralization data, I should say, um, which uh, sort of gets at some of the points I was just making. So here we're looking at um, in the solid circles, the high dose uh, of, uh, Moderna vaccine in mice and in open circles is the low dose one. And if we just look at the high dose vaccine and the low dose vaccine, of course you see more neutralizing activity with the high dose and the low dose one has titers that correspond to what we would see one month after two dose mRNA vaccines, somewhere between one to 500 and one to a thousand, maybe a little higher whereas the high dose one has almost 10 fold to 20 fold higher levels. Now, if we take this serum and we try to neutralize a variant vi a virus, in this case, the Omicron virus, B11529, the high dose one still has substantial neutralizing activity, but the low dose one, which corresponds to the levels that we see in humans, 
now has no activity uh, or is at essentially at the limit of detection, in this case, a titer of one to 60. And this is, um, you can see this graphically if we compare in a Wilcoxon paired test, the high dose one looking at the uh, parental virus versus the um, uh, B11529, we see about a tenfold reduction. But now if we go to the lower one, which has titers more similar to what we see in humans, we see this enormous uh, 20, greater than 20 fold reduction and everybody is below the prote presumed protective cutoff. So how does this translate into protection? So then we challenge the animals either with a uh, conventional uh, uh, Washington one strain, which is one from early in the pandemic, or we challenge them with the B11529. I'm not gonna go through all the data here, but if you look at the high dose, which is on the top here, you can see that everybody pretty much is protected. And that's because we had very high levels of neutralizing antibodies, both against the original virus and the uh, variant virus. However, the low dose vaccine, which again corresponds to neutralizing antibody levels that we see in humans, now we see there is some partial protection here, but the lung here, this is the lung here, you can see we see um, very little protection compared to what we see be saw before, where before we're seeing about five to seven log 10 protection. Here we're seeing about a tenfold protection in viral load. This is at one particular day. And so this suggests that there's significant breakthrough infection it, by Omicron in animals that are vaccinated only two doses of mRNA-1273, which is the Moderna vaccine. And if we look pathologically in these guys, if you give a control vaccine, these animals get severe lung, uh, pneumonia. If you give the mRNA-1273 and you challenge with the parental virus, they're complete protected. Now, if you give this B11529 uh, a challenge in these animals, it turns out that this is uh, less pathogenic in mice. Uh, it's also less pathogenic in hamsters and maybe less pathogenic in humans to some degree, but you still see evidence of pneumonitis inflammation, although it's not as severe, and you don't see much protection at all with this uh, two doses of the vaccine. So this suggests that there's complete, there's significant breakthrough infection in the lung in, when you have um, uh, uh, the lower dose of vaccine, which corresponds to probably the levels of immunity we see with two doses in humans. So let me summarize, high doses of vaccines protect against variants in mice and hamsters. I didn't share all the data. The low dose vaccine, which may be more like the levels that are seen in humans, shows evidence of significant virologic breakthrough in pneumonia with this B1152 variant in particular. In data that uh, I'm not gonna show you, variant vaccines that are more targeted to the particular strain uh, probably will do better. Whether we'll be able to implement them in time remains to be seen. And we still are trying to study some of the mechanistic properties of why this is and what the basis for the protection and failure is. And the question I think going forward is, is will we actually be able to institute a pneumochrome booster? Is it worth doing or not? And these are uh, questions that are still ongoing in many animal models by many investigators. And I'll just stop there and thank the members of my laboratory. Thank you, Mike. Um... What I'd like you to do is hold your questions, uh, put them in the chat, ideally, so that we can get when we get to them. We've asked each of the speakers to keep their remarks to about 15 minutes or so, and then we can have time at the end for questions. So I'm going to turn now to uh, Rachel Presti. Uh, Rachel is an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases. She's director of our clinical ID clinical research unit and has been heavily involved uh, in the vaccine uh, responses. Uh, uh, as part of the national uh, effort. So um, I'll turn it over to Rachel. Okay, so um, so just for disclosures, we um, we do the clinical trials with um, and have done them with Janssen and Moderna. COVID vaccines um, and, and some of the vaccines I'm discussing don't have FDA approval yet, although we're getting closer there. Um, okay, so this is just um, just a slide looking at vaccine uptake. Um, and you can see that initially there was a very, very high amount of uptake and there's been a little bit more recently, um, but really um, only um, sort of uh, in the US, not, not a great uptake um, given the amount of vaccines available um, and the amount of safety and efficacy data we have. Um, however, I, I think there's one thing that I haven't um, seen a lot of discussion of and that's actually how many people have um, antibodies against um, against this virus at this point. Um, and this is actually from November. So before the Omicron spike, um, from looking at um, blood donor seroprevalence, um, when you combine both the vaccine and infections, um, you get nearly 100% seroprevalence. So, so at this point, most people have some immunity to the virus, and yet we're still seeing these, um, these large um, peaks. 
Um, and so, so I think there's still a question as to uh, how much immunity is actually going to be necessary to keep this virus under control. I think there is evidence from, from decreasing um, mortality uh, with, the, with the Omicron strain that maybe we, um, we are getting close to having an endemic um, virus and not, uh, not as much of a pandemic, um, although still clearly a problem. Um, just a little bit of terminology, the vaccine clinical trials, which we talked about a year ago, um, were measuring um, efficacy. Um, and so they were looking in a very controlled setting where half of the population or half of the, the study group got placebo, half got vaccine, um, and, and could measure the degree to which a vaccine prevents disease and possibly transmission. Um, the situation has changed dramatically since then. Uh, you know, so, so more and more people are getting vaccinated. Still a lot of folks are not getting vaccinated, um, but the virus has changed as well. And the amount of pressure on the immune system um, to, uh, to prevent transmission and prevent infection um, has clearly also gotten um, worse. Um, so, so I think sometimes people think of efficacy as a fixed hard, concrete number like a vaccine is always going to have 95% efficacy if it did in the initial trials. That is only the case if the virus doesn't change and if the amount of circulating um, virus in the population doesn't change. And both of those have clearly changed dramatically for um, COVID-19. So, um, so then what we look at in the real world setting is effectiveness. So how well do these vaccines work um, to prevent um, infection to prevent um, severe disease to prevent um, death. So, um, so most of the data we have now, um, I don't know why this is doing this, but um, this is actually pre-Omicron. So this is data looking at real, real, real world effectiveness um, among the different vaccine products. So the Pfizer, Moderna, and Janssen vaccines um, uh, in terms of caseloads during the Delta surge. And you can see that there was a decrease in um, effectiveness against um, infection um, cases um, with all of the vaccines over time. Now, whether or not that was due to waning immunity and waning antibody levels, we do expect antibody levels to decrease. Um, that's the way the immune system works. If you had high levels of every, of every antibody that to every infection that you've ever been exposed to, then you would be nothing more than, a, you know, collection of antibodies. And so, um, so it's a little bit hard to know how much is a change in the virus versus how much is actually waning immunity. It's probably a combination of both. Um, however, we did see um, good um, protection and maintain protection um, effic effectiveness um, against hospitalizations um, with, with all the vaccines with the Delta um, variant. Um, so across cohorts without a, a huge time trend. Um, so, so clearly the vaccines are not able to maintain efficacy um, against infection with these new variants and with the amount of circulating virus that we see in these big surges. Um, but they do maintain effectiveness against um, severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Um, there was some um, discussion about um, mixing boosters um, and whether or not those would be um, better or not. Um, and so this was the data that that was based on. It's actually fairly um, small study um, and fairly short time frame, and only really looked at neutralizing antibody titers. Um, and, and you did see boosting with any one of the vaccines against any of the other vaccines. I think the most important thing is that this actually demonstrated that it was safe um, to boost with a different vaccine from the original one that you got. Um, I think that will be helpful as we move forward if there is a need to develop vaccines that are targeted specifically, that if you don't have to stick with your original vaccines, um, then, then um, it makes it easier to, to get that um, distributed to the population. Um, Mike talked quite a bit about the different variants. Um, I just wanted to point out that there have been many. Um, there are variants that are being monitored. Um, and and so, so we have seen a lot of these variants. The variants of concern have been Delta and Omicron. Um, there is a higher level of variant that so far we have not seen, but, um, but hopefully will not see in the future a variant of high consequence that would 
um, not only be uh, more infectious, but cause more severe disease or have a significant reduction in um, vaccine efficacy or susceptibility to therapeutics. Um, I think there could be some argument that Omicron approached that, um, but, but not quite to that extent. Um, I also like to point out that the vaccine companies have been developing variant vaccines um, all along. So especially the mRNA technology is fairly easy to modify quickly. Um, and thus far we haven't needed variant vaccines. So we did not, um, did not wind up getting a Delta variant vaccine, um, but it is possible that an Omicron variant vaccine might be clinically useful. Um, it may be useful also just to have sort of an updated vaccine if the virus continues to mutate off the new um, Omicron um, sequence. So what happened with Omicron? This is vaccine um, effectiveness against symptomatic disease. Um, and this is from the United Kingdom. Um, and you can see in the, the black dots, um, though that is um, effectiveness against Delta. Um, and the gray dots is effectiveness against Omicron. Um, and then um, the, the line actually here where, where uh, um, after two doses of either the, uh, of the, of the um, adenovirus vector, the um, AstraZeneca adenovirus vector, you can see after six months that the effectiveness against symptomatic disease went to zero um, for Omicron. However, if you boosted um, with an mRNA booster, you um, increase the effectiveness against even just symptomatic disease up to 60%. So, um, so the boosters clearly do help uh, after um, uh, against even just symptomatic disease. Um, the same thing is true for, um, for both Pfizer and Moderna um, vaccines as well. You see drop in efficacy against Omicron, eff eff effectiveness against Omicron, um, for symptomatic disease um, if you've only had two doses and that, that is by six months after the second dose, um, you see this drop in effectiveness to essentially zero um, that, is, um, that is helped by giving a booster. Um, and so uh, the mRNA, the Moderna booster on top of um, either a Moderna or Pfizer um, vaccine actually gets effectiveness up to about 80% against symptomatic disease. Um, so, so, um, so it is really, really important to get a booster. Now, some of that is actually boosting the antibody response um, uh, to a level where you know it, the the virus um, can be um, neutralized and we can get um, we can get less infection. Uh, so, this is data from South Africa. So. Um, where the Omicron virus actually initially came out. And this is the only, I'm showing this mainly because this is the only data we have really for um, Johnson & Johnson. Um, you can see um, that in South Africa, they also saw an effectiveness drop, and this is against hospitalizations. So not cases, but hospitalizations. Um, before Omicron, um, effectiveness was 93% for the Pfizer vaccine, the two doses of Pfizer after Omicron became the, the um, dominant strain, um, the effectiveness dropped to 70% against hospitalization. For um, Johnson & Johnson, um, it, it just so happened that the, the recommendation for a booster or a second dose of J&J, &J, um, that data came out um, early enough that there was a study of healthcare workers, um, Sasanski II study, where they had given them two doses of J&J of, um, &J and were able to look then at effectiveness against hospitalizations with the two doses of J&J. &J. And, um, and you can see that the effectiveness um, with two doses of J&J &J actually was quite good. So um, this is against hospitalization uh, in the first, um, you know, up to, up to in the 80, 85%, um, even up to 93%. Um, in the epicenter of the Omicron um, cert, uh, cases in South Africa. So in the US, this is the, the data from the US so far, um, comparing um, two doses uh, of the mRNA vaccines um, versus three doses, uh, booster dose um, against hospitalization um, and comparing in the blue line um, for Delta, 
and the red line for Omicron. So clearly a booster helps considerably um, against in, in sort of re-upping uh, the antibody response, re-upping the immune response so that you have um, less, uh, less hospitalizations and less deaths. And that's also shown here. Um, this is actually cases um, in unvaccinated people um, with the, during the Omicron period um, with only the primary series and with, um, with a boosted um, dose. So you can see much lower incidence of um, cases in people who've been boosted. Um, I wanted to just speak very, very briefly on, on some of the research response that we've had um, uh, in doing vaccine trials. So um, Washington University did the Janssen one-dose trial and the two-dose trial um, and is doing Moderna, um, the pediatric studies, um, as well as um, we've been doing booster vaccine studies, actually have ongoing booster vaccine studies um, with different variant vaccines. So um, with the beta delta variant um, vaccine, and then also currently enrolling people who have gotten Moderna to a vaccine study um, using the Omicron vaccine study. If you're interested, feel free to contact me. Um, as part of those studies, we have been able to take advantage of the fact that this is essentially a new um, antigen that people are being exposed to and to actually see in real time what the human immune response is, not just in the blood, but also in draining lymph nodes and in the bone marrow. These are um, collaborations with Ali Alabidi um, that have been incredibly interesting. Um, this is actually with the original vaccine, um, Pfizer uh, vaccine, looking at um, um, the response in the blood. And you can see very good response in red there. That's for people who had no prior infection in the black. You can see a higher response in antibodies um, in people who had um, prior infection, although it is not dramatically different. So it is not clear that prior infection really does give you as strong of an, an as consistent of an immune response as, um, as the vaccines do. Um, and then this is the lymph node. Um, you just get this very exuberant response in the lymph node. And um, with collaborations with radiology, we've been able to access the um, germinal center B cells in the lymph nodes and, um, and actually shown a really um, prolonged um, lymph node germinal cell B cell response. So this is 201 days um, in one of our participants. Um, 201 days, you still see spike-specific um, binding of germinal center B cells. So the, it's clear that the immune system is continuing to try to respond to, um, to the vaccines for, for quite some time and perfect that immune response. So, so I think um, you know, we are seeing that people have an immune response and hopefully over time um, we'll see decreasing um, hospitalization and, um, and mortality from, from this infection. So ongoing research, we are continuing to monitor um, both efficacy in controlled trials as well as effectiveness, um, continuing to characterize the immune response, um, look at the potency of neutralization and also the T cell responses um, against the emerging variants. Um, I think the booster vaccinations are going to be really, really interesting, both um, in terms of, of an immunologic understanding of original antigenic sin and how do you shift the immune response. Is, is a booster of the original vaccine sufficient or do you get a better protection if you get boosted from a variant vaccine that matches um, the virus better? And then just some... Um, Acknowledgements, um, we've got a great team at the research unit and have had tremendous collaborations with um, Dr. Ali Alabidi and his lab, with Mike Diamond and his lab, um, with the radiologists, Sherry Teefee and Bill Middleton, um, especially, um, and Iskra Pusik for the um, bone marrow um, studies that I haven't shown. Um, and I will stop there. Thank you, Rachel. Um... Uh, we will move rapidly now to the third speaker, uh, Dr. Jane O'Halloran. Uh, Jane has been heavily involved as assistant professor of medicine in the, in, in the Department of Medicine uh, in Infectious Diseases and has been heavily involved in some, many of the therapeutic trials, um, as well as uh, some of the vaccine trials and, and other aspects of clinical research. Uh, 
Uh, so J Jane will give you an update on where we are with therapeutics. Thank you very much. And thank you to Dr. Diamond and Dr. Presti for excellent talks. I'm gonna to just touch briefly on some updates around treatment. Um, so I have no disclosures other than to say that um, uh, we, some of the ter therapies that I will discuss have not been used or have not got um, formal approval, but are being used under EUA. Um, excuse me one moment. I'm just going to stop sharing here because I have the wrong set of slides. My apologies. Okay. So um, I suppose the main thing that I'm going to focus on really, um, can you see my slides? No, not yet. Okay. Okay, so the main thing that I'm gonna focus on really this morning um, is to talk mainly about um, some of the more common uses now that we have of treatments that we've had for some time and also to touch briefly on the, um, also to touch briefly on the novel oral therapies. So just one moment here now. Okay. Editing, okay. I'm just going to share here. And for some, okay. Okay. All right, okay. My no, sincere apology. It's gone again. It's gone again. You have it there? No, it's gone again. Oh, I'm sorry. We had it very briefly. Sorry, I came into the office this morning and uh, technology yeah. is not. Okay, here we go. There we go. Okay, so um, so I suppose I'm going to talk mainly on some of the current treatments that we have. As we all know, um, we can focus on these treatments by looking at them grouped into antivirals, such as remdesivir or some of the new oral agents, but also including the monoclonal antibodies in that category of drugs that really have a more of an antiviral approach. Um, and the versus the immune modulator treatments. And to be honest, there hasn't been a significant amount of change in the immune modulator treatments that are recommended in the last couple of months. So I'm not actually going to speak much, I'm not going to speak on those really today. Um, just to say that we would um, have some newer data coming out in the next couple of months um, from the study that we participated here in the active one trial, um, which may or may not add additional um, therapies in the immune modulator category. So thinking about the, um, the disease in general, I think when we're thinking about treatments, we really have to come back to this, um, this diagram and to really consider the um, COVID in these phases, not so much even in the hospitalized versus non-hospitalized, because those lines are all, almost becoming blurred now with people coming in and having coincidental COVID and, 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 and so on. But to really think about it is when the patient in front of you, are they in a viral response phase or they, are they in a more host inflammatory phase. And yes, it is correct that most of those who are in the viral response phase do tend to be in the outpatient setting because those are the earlier symptoms and um, the more chorizal symptoms and over time they progress into the other, into the other phases. Um, but I think looking at it in these phases is very helpful. And um, we know from new data on remdesivir that was recently published from the pine tree study um, that this is an important way to approach it. Um, we're all familiar with using remdesivir in the inpatient setting um, because of the way it's been, um, it's been administered. But um, although not a particularly practical trial, the pine tree um, study recently reported outpatient use of remdesivir, um, essentially in those who had symptoms for less than seven days. Um, those people did need to be high risk by virtue of the fact that they had um, comorbidities or age-related risk. Um, and within this study, the, rel the relative risk reduction was about 87% um, prevention of progression to hospitalization or all-cause mortality. Um, so kind of you know, focusing on where this fits really well, you know, this is more data contributing to the fact that we really should be using antivirals in the antiviral stage of the disease, which seems like, like pretty common sense. Um, and I suppose, you know, from a practical perspective, this is a good option for those high risk hospitalized patients who happen to have coincidental COVID um, diagnosed when they're here for another admission or who happen to develop COVID flu-like or COVID-like symptoms 
early in the um, early in an admission type process. Um, thinking again about you know using antivirals or anti or treatments that work in the antiviral phase, um, are, I suppose our monoclonal antibodies um, are, are are something we consider. Um, so far, these have really only been shown to be useful in that early phase. So all of these studies here um, looked at patients who were at high risk of progression um, to either hospitalization or death um, and who had risk factors. Um, and usually the, the inclusion criteria vary a little bit, but usually um, needed to have symptoms no more than um, seven days of onset, seven to 10 days of onset, and really showed a 70 to 85 um, percent relative risk reduction. So in line with what we saw um, with remdesivir. But um, the problem is, I suppose, that as, as Dr. Diamond has pointed out um, very clearly, many of those treatments are not currently work, uh, working because we have 99.9% .9 Omicron virus circulating as of last week, leaving us with just really one monoclonal um, to use. But I suppose one of the points I want to make is related to this data all, is all in the outpatient setting. When we look at those patients who are more likely to be in the immune phase, um, we see that there has been um, significant issues with the use of these um, with the use of these monoclonal antibodies. And the, the slide is currently actually missing from my data set. But if you look at the studies of the patients who and participated in the inpatient studies of use of monoclonal antibodies. There have been several of these studies, all of which shown, have shown null results. But when those studies um, sub-categorize um, the participants into those who have antibody positive versus antibody negative um, at the time of enrollment, we can see that in, in at least three studies, <coughs> there is a trend towards participants who are antibody positive um, at the time of enrollment, having actually a worse outcome. Um, this is offset in the results by those who are antibody negative, maybe having a slight positive um, outcome, meaning that really we need to be very careful that we are using these treatments in the correct setting. So it's not necessarily fair to say that, okay, monoclonal antibodies don't work um, in hospitalized or in people who are in, in a more um, progressed part of their um, disease course, but they, you know, but sure, you know, we can try it, what harm? There may actually be harm. And it is important that we, we tease that out. And that would also apply to convalescent plasma, immune, um, hyperimmune globulin, and those type of treatments. The issue really is that at present, it is very difficult to do that because we don't have real-time point-of-care assays that allow us to determine, you know, who are those patients that who that present um, to the to the hospital hospital setting who are still zero negative and therefore could potentially benefit versus those who are zero positive and may actually um, may actually have harm from these treatments. So with that, I'm just going to move a little bit further on and talk about some of the oral antivirals um, that we now have access to. Um, so at the moment, there are two main um, antivirals um, that are um, FDA um, EUA approved um, for the treatment of COVID in, and these are in the outpatient setting. And um, so the, those are molnupiravir and Paxlovid. So starting with molnupiravir, and um, this is a nucleoside, it's given us four pills, um, four, time, four pills two times a day. And the interim analysis um, got a lot of uh, press. And um, I suppose at that time when it was conducted, the, the results appeared that it would have a fifth it would have about a 50% relative risk reduction of hospitalization. Unfortunately, um, the subsequent analysis, the full protocol, um, when it was enrolled to what it was supposed to, really only showed about a 30% um, risk reduction of hospitalization and all cause mortality, which was a substantial drop and also places it in an area where there are probably other treatments that are better um, in this for this particular um, category of patient. The other thing, uh, is it really is kind of unclear as to why that happened. You know, there, there's, there's several theories, um, but I don't think there's any very clear explanation as to the drop. One of them is suggested that, well, okay, there may be different circulating um, strains at the time, but when you actually look at the difference between the strains that were circulating 
um, in the interim analysis in the full population, they weren't all that different, really. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what the, the reason for that is, but, but in essence, the take home is that it has lower efficacy um, than um, other potential treatments for this group. There is no data in pregnancy. And it also is important to mention that there is this whole issue around mutagenicity um, surrounding molnupiravir. Um, at present, there are ongoing, and that data really comes actually from animal trials, particularly dog trials, um, demonstrating problems with development of cartilage and bone um, um, development. So quite problematic, potentially. Um, not to say that it necessarily will, will fully translate into being an issue in humans, but at present there are carcinogenicity, carcinogenicity and testicular germ cell mutation assay studies ongoing. But in the meantime, to circumvent that, um, what has been recommended by the FDA is that, that if you are prescribing this for a woman of childbearing potential, um, then you would need to use, th that person would need to be on reliable contraception um, for at least four days after they complete um, treatment, so nine days in total. That in itself is not such a, an issue. However, we very, very frequently forget um, to look at the childbearing potential in, in our male patients. So if a male patient has a, uh, has a partner um, or could um, impregnate a partner, um, then, it, then that is also an issue. And in male patients who are in that situation, we actually need to make sure that they are on reliable contraception for three months um, because of the, the germ cell uh, mutation potential. Um, so those are just things to think about. So moving along to our other oral antiviral, um, so nermotrilavir, um, which is boosted with ritonavir. Um, these are protease inhibitors, and this is um, more commonly known as Paxlovid. Um, it's given as two pills of nermotrilavir. Um, a day in, in morning and two in the evening, along with one pill um, of ritonavir and twice. Um, and this is, you know, protease inhibitors are, are medications that we are very familiar with through the treatment of HIV and hepatitis C. Um, so we have a little bit more familiarity about this. So on the screen, you can see the data that has been released. Um, and this data actually comes from the EUA. The study has not been um, peer reviewed, published yet. Um, but the looking at um, those participants who were um, randomized to receive um, Paxlovid um, versus no treatment, um, there was an 80, approximately 90% risk reduction, um, relative risk reduction in hospitalization or all-cause death. And the initial study actually was designed to look at those who had symptoms for less than five days. However, there was an amendment about halfway through that actually reduced that to less than three to three days or less. And um, so that the so the main study outcome is three days or less, and that's that 90%. But I think um, in the interest of needing to know what was happening in the five days or less, that analysis is also there. And it, it's it holds pretty strong at about 88%. Um, so as I mentioned to you, these are protease inhibitors, and uh, from the world of HIV, we know that um, these, particularly ritonavir, have many, many drug-drug interactions that people need to be aware about if they are prescribing. Some of the drug-drug interactions that we would worry about as HIV prescribers are probably less important in that, you know, we only have patients on this drug for, for five days, but there are some that are absolute contraindications. Um, that said, there are excellent resources available um, if you want to use these drugs. Um, so I would recommend the HIV drug interaction checker from Liverpool University. Um, and you can see the, the website on the screen. This is, is, is a very reliable resource, um, as are um, your uh, clinical pharmacists who have been working with these drugs for a long time or your HIV providers who will be happy to help out, I'm sure. Um, so the take home points really relating to um, to Paxlovid is that it, it has similar efficacy um, to what was seen in the studies with IV um, remdesivir and um, the monoclonal antibodies. However, I will say that it is really important to note that these drugs were not done, uh, analyzed in head-to-head -head trials. So, you know, um, the one thing that we do know, and we certainly have heard from Dr. Diamond and Dr. Presti, is that time is incredibly important, and when things are trialed, is incredibly important um, in the management of COVID. So it's not fair to directly compare them, um, but it, it, it gives us a rough idea. Um, for Paxlovid as well, the other thing, thing to bear in mind, it is licensed for those who are 12 and over, monopiravir is really 18 and over. 
um, we do have drug-drug interactions and it does need to be dose reduced in um, renal toxicity. And um, so the main, um, so those with EGF4 of 30 to 60, it can be dose reduced after that, it needs, it can, it's contraindicated. Um, so, and the other thing that I should point out in all of these studies is that patients who were vaccinated were not included. So this um, in itself means that, you know, we still don't know um, whether you would have as much benefit in, in, that, um, in that vaccinated population as we saw in these studies. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, stop. Um, we still have some ongoing research questions that are outstanding. Most of those really relate to um, what are we doing in the immune modulator um, sphere where we are in a situation where at the moment, when we use immune modulators, we tend to be using two together. So steroid plus something else. Um, what are we doing with immune modulators in the immunosuppressed um, sphere? And many of those patients were excluded from studies. And then is there anything we can do to tease out whether the monoclonal antibodies do have a role in inpatient populations, especially in patient populations, or is there a way that we can triage um, those who may benefit um, by virtue of their zero status? So thank you very much and apologies for the technical issues. Thanks very much, uh, Jen, and thanks to all three of you for sticking to time. Uh, we have we have some time now for some questions, and I'll start with a few that are already in the chat uh, for Mike. One, Mike says, uh, why is Omicron less pathogenic? Um, I might actually start by asking the question, is it truly less pathogenic? But but the, the, the interesting aspect of the question is, does this provide a path towards future attenuation to lead to a live vaccine? And, and would we? So um, it, it's a bit complicated. It's definitely less pathogenic in rodents. That's clear. Um, in humans, uh, it was unclear for a while because we were dealing with many of the infections being in the setting of pre-existing antigen experience, meaning people were vaccinated partially, completely, or people were already infected. And so rather than looking at its uh, inherent pathogenicity, you're looking at how it is interacting with an already existing immune response. And there clearly it was causing less severe disease uh, than um, might be expected from somebody who had no immunity. But that's not really the right comparison. Mm -hmm. That just tells you that vaccines work and pre-existing immunity due to infections actually work to prevent severe disease. That's what, there's, that's what your memory response mm -hmm. is supposed to do. Um, the key data that has emerged now from parts of uh, Africa is in studies of children under five uh, and who don't have any vaccine and don't have pre-existing immunity based on serologic analysis, and also in the small number of studies where there is uh, people who are unvaccinated and uninfected. Rachel alluded to that is a, a, a dwindling population over time. And in that data, it appears that uh, Omicron is less pathogenic, but it is not not pathogenic. That's nuts. Um, what it means is that if you took 100 people and uh, you know five of them would normally with Washington one or Delta or beta go to the uh, uh, ICU and require a vent or whatever it is, you might have two or three. So there's a substantial reduction, but there's still a lot of people getting very sick with this requiring significant interventions and some people dying from it just at lower rates. So it is not a, a non-pathogenic virus. It is mildly less pathogenic uh, based on data that we have in animals and humans. But I don't think that this is a path to attenuation. I would not recommend Russian roulette and taking this virus and say, well, I'll, I'll just get it and be protected because you just never know what your genetics are to be able to go forward. So I think that's not a great idea. I think if you wanna make an attenuated virus, make an attenuated virus prospectively, um, you can use some of the lessons we've learned, okay, well, monitoring the spike might be good, but I think you gotta make a bunch of other mutations to do this. And so I, I think that there's risk certainly in thinking about you can just use this virus as an attenuated uh, uh, version for, for vaccines. Thanks, Mike. Um, I couldn't agree more. The, Rachel, um, could you comment, uh, Mike raised the question at the end of whether we should, uh, we should have Omicron-specific uh, va vaccines. Could you raise? Could you comment on whether um, you think uh, variant-specific vaccines are going to be required, or whether that's just catch up with the last variant? Um, 
so I'm bad at predictions, but um, I, <laughs> I think it, it, given the number of mutations in the Omicron um, virus, um, I, I think, um, you could make an argument that it may be useful to get boosted the same way we get boosted with a different flu vaccine um, every year. That that sort of shifting the immune response to um, to a more contemporary virus um, would likely be helpful. Um, if you know, particularly if we start seeing that you know that we really do see enough waning immunity that we that we are having spikes. Um, I have previously told people I didn't think we would need an annual um, COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and now I think I think all bets are off. I think this is something, a space that we're going to need to continue to watch. Um, I do think we probably will need um, booster vaccines for, for some period of time. Um, and I think the question is, does this really turn into a seasonal coronavirus, um, which causes a mild enough illness um, very, very rarely um, puts people in the hospital um, and, uh, you know, and wouldn't be worth continuing to chase um, to try to actually um, prevent disease or if this stays more pathogenic as, um, as thus far it seems like it is. Sorry, not an answer. Well, it is. Um, Jane, could you comment on the uses of trovimab in immunocompromised hospitalized patients who are unlikely to mount robust antibody responses, such as BMT or solid organ transplant patients? So I suppose that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier on, that there is probably a subpopulation that could benefit um, from the use of these medications if they were actually available and, um, and known to work against the particular variant. Um, I think part of the issue is that um, it really does come down to what's currently available and, and, and where the use of that is best applied um, in a population where we think they haven't mounted a monoclonal or mounted an antibody response, yes, theoretically. Um, however, I think an, any antiviral in that setting may be beneficial. So, you know, in a hospitalized setting you, where we have people that we can give IV um, remdesivir to, I think that is a, another solution at present when we don't have vast supplies um, and kind of using those supplies to prevent people being admitted. So, you know, I, I would like to see more, more research in that field in particular, because we do need to determine whether there is really a deleterious effect from doing it if people are too far along um, or not. Don't, don't you think that given where we are in terms of the, evo the evolution of resistance that using antivirals in that population, at least at the moment, might be a, uh, rather than at monoclonals, it might be a more appropriate? Um... Yeah, no, for sure. I think antivirals, you know, that is the way to go for, for sure. Um, if, we have, if we have people admitted and we can give them antivirals, because yes, theoretically, the, the, you know, as we saw with the development of Omicron, it probably developed from somebody who had significant immune compromise and couldn't clear the virus and um, hence mutated. And um, so that is the population where, where that can happen and where we can have breakthrough um, with our monoclonal antibodies. So ideally using other antivirals um, in that situation um, is something that we sh should consider. Because as I said, we don't really know whether the monoclonals work in that in that field. Okay, Mike, very quickly, a couple of specific questions. What do you think about the results showing Omicron has a defect in, to generate cell fusion because it doesn't use the TMP or S, S2 protease? Yeah, so a few things here. So um, SARS-CoV-1, the original SARS, doesn't use Tempris-2 and is able to infect lung cells just fine. And what was shown early on was that SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 do not require absolutely Tempris-2 to get into cells. They can get in via canonical endocytosis. If you cleave with Tempris-2, you can uh, fuse at the plasma membrane. That said, um, the data now is emerging from a couple of groups suggesting that Omicron variant is uh, less able to use Tempris-2, and that might alter its tropism a bit. So it may not get into certain cells, but it might get into other cells through canonical endocytosis pathways. 
The significance of that is not totally clear. The, the speculation in the field by a couple of these authors without in vivo corroboration is that the altered use of Tempris 2 or lack of ability to use it as efficiently has driven the virus more to the upper airway and less to the lower airway based on some organoid cultures. But this has not been validated in vivo, so we don't know for certain if this is the explanation. But it is possible that altering its Tempris 2 dependent will alter its tropism and could explain some of the differential impacts on uh, infectivity in different parts of the respiratory tract. Okay, I mean, we're now past the hour. I'll take, I'm going to do one question because I think it's it's interesting. Uh, all of the questions are interesting, but one that either Mike or, or I'll start with Rachel and Mike might want to chime in. So, with the idea of re repeated vaccinations, is there a worry about eventually developing a reaction or immunity to the vaccine components, um, that, and particularly those who are not mRNA, making the platforms less effective? Yeah. So. So I, I think it's one of the nice things about the mRNA vaccines is, is they're actually pretty clean. You know, I mean, there's not a whole lot in there besides the mRNA. So, um, and the whole point is to make a response to that mRNA. So, so I wouldn't think that would um, change that platform significantly. Um, I, I suspect this is partly stemming from um, some past experience using adenovectors um, in HIV vaccines where prior immunity to um, to the vector actually resulted in a, a, a actually enhancement of, of um, infection against HIV. Um, as some of these, I, I think that's something to watch. Um, I think that's something that, that is being watched very closely actually. Um, but but uh, at least for the J and J vaccine, um, the vector that they're using, the ad5 vector, doesn't appear to have a correlation between prior immunity to the vector and efficacy of the vaccine. Um, and so, so I think it's probably going to be something to keep an eye on. But um, right now, I don't think that is expected to be a problem. Um, it, it'll probably depend on you know, how, many, how many vaccines we actually wind up getting and, and whether or not we need annual vaccines. OK. Um... Obviously, there are several more questions. I apologize for not getting around to everybody's, but um, we are past our hour, and I want to thank the three speakers for really an excellent update. And I'll just pass it back to John for any brief announcements he needs to make. Uh, I'd echo my thanks, Dr. Powderly, to you and to our speakers today, and generally to the ID department for their work throughout this pandemic. Um, thank you for everything you've done. We really appreciate your time today. Um, as a brief reminder to everybody, um, we've got some fantastic talks uh, continuing throughout this month. And in particular, one month from today, we have Dr. Rochelle Walensky joining us, the director of the CDC. So please add that to your calendars. She's going to be here in person. It's going to be a fantastic opportunity for all of us. So once again, thank you. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to Dr. Powderly. And we hope to see you all again soon. Stay safe out there. <laughs>